So our last session, um, and taking a page from uh, Byron's note of gratitude, I, I too want to acknowledge how much I've learned. I've taught nine of the 10 students who are presenting today, and, and in my life, uh, many ways have been touched by all of them, so thank you for that. Our presenter is Magali de Bueno, uh, whose title has now uh, been revised to the Grace Quest for Justice, Redefining Justice as Gift Through Carl Runner's Transcendental Anthropology. Uh, Magali is an alum of uh, the undergraduate program in Spanish theology, soon to be an alum of our grad program. Uh, it's hard to avoid university relations when you have both a BA and MA from one university. Um, she's nearly completed with her MA degree in theology. She's also working on a bilingual education teaching credential, and after graduation, she hopes to pursue a PhD in systematic theology with a concentration in social ethics. Her chapter, entitled Chasing a Dream in a Foreign Land, will appear in the book Hungering and Thirsting for Justice, Stories from Young Adult Catholics. That will be out this September from ACTA Publications. So congratulations on that. Her theological and pastoral interests include systematic theology, theological anthropology, social ethics, U.S. Latino theology, Ignatian spirituality and Christian spirituality and mysticism. Uh, <laughs> Catherine Lash is our respondent. She's in her first year of her master's uh, degree here in theology, uh, and she's also an alum of LMU, so she will equally have be challenged by university relations. <laughs> she currently serves as the administrative assistant for LMU's programs in Catholic Studies, Jewish Studies, and the Huffington Ecumenical Institute, as well as the Journal for the American Academy of Religion. Her interests include moral and systematic theology and the philosophy of religion. When she finishes her degree in approximately 17 years, but that's not going to be the case, uh, she hopes to pursue a career in some sort of ministry. So please join me in welcoming Magali and Kat. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? OK. So first of all, I want to thank the Say Something Theological Committee for allowing me to present this project. And I want to thank especially Dr. Rothschild, who has put up with various drafts of this thesis, Dr. Seiker, who has helped me to pronounce the words in Greek, everyone who has helped me to pronounce German, and um, Dr. Deloro and Father Rausch, who have also been um, very important for this thesis and this presentation. And lastly, my mom for listening to my Ronarian rhetoric for the past four months. <laughs> This presentation represents a very small portion of an entire thesis on Karl Rahner's notion of the foregriff and its relation to grace for the purposes of redefining the common concept of justice, which is understood as a right. The foregriff is a result of the gift of God's self-communication understood by Rahner as grace. I argue that Rahner's transcendental anthropology can provide a more constructive understanding of justice more thoroughly grounded in action. This presentation will argue that grace creates the condition of the possibility for justice. In light of this connection between grace and justice and justice's relation to the transcendental experience, there is a need to rethink justice as a theological category and view it as a gift instead of purely as a right. The primary way in which society understands justice today is through written laws and treatises on human rights which inform us of what we are entitled to. This typically results in much talk about justice in terms of individual claims with little attention to its relational aspects and connection to action. Instead of viewing justice as a right, Rahner can illuminate an understanding of justice rooted in gratuitousness. The gift of justice makes one aware of injustices and moves one to action in love which is ultimately the only manner in which justice can be a constructive force for change in our world. I engage Rahner, one of the great Catholic theologians of the 20th century, as a foundation for this redefinition. Rahner asserts that the human spirit is in the world and at the same time transcending the world through the foregriff auf esse, the pre-apprehension of being, through which the human spirit reaches out toward what is nameless and infinite. The pre-apprehension is the spirit transcending itself toward the infinite God while still being in the world. Rahner characterized the human being as in continuous relationship with God. This relationship is for all humankind, characterized as pure openness for being as such. And he explains this by calling humans 
hearers of the word while God is the word. This means that every aspect of our being is structured toward the unlimited, toward the foregriff, and even the most mundane questions we ask can lead us to God because real transcendence is always in the background, in those origins of human life and human knowledge over which we have no control. In addition to being hearers of the word, the human being is the event of a free, unmerited, and forgiving, and absolute self-communication of God. God's grace. The divine communication affects the human's very essence and makes possible the foregriff. With this brief introduction to Rahner's portrait of the human being, I will move into the foundations of his foregriff and how it is rooted in the gift of grace. In every act of knowing an object, the human being transcends or goes beyond it. Self-transcendence occurs when the human being raises analytical questions about him or herself and opens up him or herself to the unlimited horizon of such questioning. The very fact that questions are raised means that the person has opened up to the unlimited, that is, transcendental, horizon that grounds these questions, transcending the concreteness, the categoriality, of the questions themselves. In every act of knowledge, one realizes that one is limited and finite, but also one is propelled toward the ultimate horizon of all knowing, God, through the foregriff, and no finite object will ever satisfy this hunger to know. Consequently, because of the foregriff, one is capable of knowing anything, and has at least an unthematic and anonymous knowledge of God, albeit in a sense different from knowing other daily objects. We experience God as a mystery with which we are always familiar, something which we love, even when we are terrified by it, uh, by of it, I'm sorry, terrified by it, or perhaps even annoyed and angered and want to be done with it. The human's openness to absolute fullness of being makes possible the acceptance or rejection of this mystery. Rahner says that even in fear or rejection of the mystery, we have already given an answer to the unanswerable question. Whether the right or wrong one is here beside the point. The central idea of the foregriff is that it is an a priori condition, given freely with human nature, that enables us to be continually connected with God implicitly in daily life. The foregriff's aim is God, and whether or not persons understand this, their relation to God as an explicit one, their reality, the reality of the relation is there. This relationship is so vital to the human being because God is the basic fundamental ground of all activities, such as loving or thinking. Thus, the foregriff is the transcendental condition of the possibility of an object known as object. It is vital for this presentation to emphasize that the free gift of the foregriff is not limited to, as Kant would say, theoretical reason. Rather, it also includes practical reason. This means that the person is oriented toward God in every human act including the act of justice. Rahner offers three images to help explain the foregriff. The first, in a Thomistic fashion, is movement. The foregriff is the original transcendental condition by which the human being moves beyond the present. This movement toward God grounds every act, and it is because of this infinite telos, goal, that the human being is able to act. This dynamism toward God takes place on a deep level, and although it is the basic structure of any human act, it remains implicit, much like our understanding of right and wrong remains somewhat implicit. Because of this, the human being has a deeper sense of justice beyond what society dictates in laws, a depth rooted in God's free gift of grace, which creates the condition of the possibility for our identifying justice. A second image is light. Light enables one to see objects, and when seeing them, one becomes aware of the source that sheds light. This image shows that the foregriff is both an awareness of God and a condition of the possibility of all action. This relates directly to action for justice. Like the light, God's grace, the source of the foregriff, makes one aware of injustices and makes one able to respond to them in action. In rethinking justice as a gift, we realize that the origin of justice is found in God. A third image is the horizon. 
The particular objects we know are always known against and within the infinite horizon of being. The known objects are in our immediate foreground, while in the background lies our awareness of God. The foregriff makes the human being conscious by opening up the horizon within which the single object of human knowledge is known. Ultimately, with the foregriff, Rahner is suggesting that all human acts are made possible by an awareness of God that goes beyond our visible world. With regards to justice, we know immediately that certain things are wrong, and we know this against the greater horizon of God's action for the world, which has God's kingdom as its telos. The foregriff is made possible by God's grace, which is God's gift of love. Rahner coined the term supernatural existential in order to explain God's offer of grace, which permanently modifies the human spirit, giving it an ontological drive toward God. Theologically speaking, everything that exists is oriented toward immediacy with God, that is, the beatific vision. The self-communication of God is experienced as the ever-astounding wonder, the unexpected, unexacted gift of God's opening up God's self in, in, in ultimate intimacy. It occurs because God's love creates an emptiness in the human being that God wants to freely fill. God creates the human being as the event of this unmerited self-communication because God wants every person to be saved. This self-communication is ontological in that God, in his most proper reality, makes himself the innermost constitutive element of the human. Since God's gratuitous self-communication is one of love, whatever we encounter in our experience with justice demands a response in love. This means that God's gift is the condition of the possibility of the experience of justice. Every human act of love has its source in God's love, and grace cannot be thought of independently of the personal love of God and its answer in the human. The free gift of grace does not presuppose that the human being will always accept the gift. Rather, the person has a choice of either an absolute yes or no to God. Due to the intensely intimate nature of grace, the gift can often be ignored, denied, or misunderstood, much like the foregriff. Nevertheless, this grace will not be exhausted due to its universal nature. It is the inescapable setting of a person's existence. This does not make the gift any less special because only what is given to everybody realizes the real essence of grace in a radical way. Grace occurs in the transcendental experience, which goes beyond what we know, choose, and love, moving us toward God as a basic mode of being prior to every objective experience. This dimension of the human spirit is called by Rahner transcendental, and the other dimension involving finite objects, people, and situations in daily life is categorical. Grace is experienced daily in the categorical cares, concerns, fears, and hopes of the quotidian. At the same time, the transcendental experience is a condition of the possibility of categorical experience, that without which we would not be able to have any experience at all. In the transcendental experience, the human being can realize that she is absolutely dependent on God and has freedom vis-a-vis -vis God. Although the transcendental experience can also be overlooked and is present only as a secret ingredient, the human being remains as the totally open existent to whom the silent and uncontrollable infinity of reality is always present as mystery, and real transcendence and grace remain in the background. Rahner elaborates on the real experience of grace, which he says lies in such moments as keeping quiet when we felt we were being unfairly treated, or deciding on some action only by, quote, the innermost judgment of our conscience, deep down, where one can no longer tell or explain it to anyone where one knows that one is taking a decision which no one else can take in one's place and for which one will have to answer for all eternity." Unquote. Such experiences are a deep sense that the spirit is more than merely part of this temporal world. It is palpable how these two examples can relate to justice. Rahner continues, quote, when we let ourselves go in this experience of the spirit, when the tangible and assignable, the reliable element disappears, when everything takes on the taste of death and destruction, then, in actual fact, it is not merely the Spirit, but the Holy Spirit who is at work in us. Then is the hour of God's grace. The, then, 
the seemingly uncanny, bottomless depth of our experience, as experienced by us, is the bottomless depth of God communicating God's self to us." Unquote. We become aware of the Holy Spirit when we let ourselves go in the discomfort when we, f we feel when witnessing an injustice. Though this letting go can be experienced as a bottomless depth, we can encounter God in this apparent nothingness. We are gifted with this knowledge of something not being right, and we are called to respond. The grace-filled, unthematic moments in which we have a sense of what is just or unjust must not be ignored because society gives preference to written justice. Knowledge of justice goes beyond what is written because it is rooted in God actively communicating with us giving us the possibility to act or to ignore the experience of the spirit. A concrete example can help clarify this. I invite you to think about your reaction when you see someone who is homeless. What is stirred within you? Are you moved to pity? Are you afraid? Are you repulsed? These reactions are not merely negative feelings, but signs that one is witnessing an injustice. The human's letting go into this experience can motivate him or her to respond in love and not retreat from fear or uneasiness. The parable of the Good Samaritan is an example of a person responding in justice to an experience of the Spirit. The phrase in Luke that describes the Samaritan as moved with pity is crucial because the Samaritan actually experiences a sensation deeper than this. Gustavo Gutierrez tells us that the Samaritan approached the injured man on the side of the road not because of some cold religious obligation, but because his heart was melting. This is literally what the verb splagnizo mine or splagnizain means in Luke 10, 33. The verb is rooted in the noun splakna, which means bowels, entrails, or inward parts. Figuratively, splakna refers to the seat of the emotions, connoting a very powerful feeling deep in the person's gut. What the Samaritan experiences is, in Ronarian terms, a form of God's self-communication. The categorical experience of seeing the injured man brings alive the transcendental experience, compelling the Samaritan to act on behalf of an unknown man to whom the Samaritan becomes neighbor. Rahner claims that the love of neighbor is not merely the preparation, effect, fruit, and touchstone of the love of God, but it is itself an act of this love of God. It really unites the human with God. I claim that the explicit love of neighbor in acts of justice is the love of God. When a person refuses to love her neighbor, Rahner asserts that it is radically true by an ontological and not merely moral or psychological necessity that this person also cannot love God whom he cannot see. It is paramount to our existence that we love, since love is, in Rahner's words, the totality of that which the human person is. The new model of justice as a gift of action is rooted in the connection between the love of God and love of neighbor, and in Rahner's understanding of the human life as driven by and infused with grace. The idea of justice being proposed here is rooted in the biblical understanding of justice, which cannot be removed from its intrinsic link to the righteousness of God, which requires action. Dikaiosune, the word generally used to speak of the righteousness of God, is based on the verb dikaiao, which means to render righteous or to justify. Thus, dikaiosune denotes an active God, biased in favor of the most vulnerable in society. When considering this with Rahner's theology of grace, justice is relational and oriented forward, but first and foremost, it is rooted in love, active love. Rahner says, love of neighbor is the basis and sum total of the moral as such. The act of love for another is the all-embracing basic act of the human, which gives meaning, direction, and measure to everything else. To be human and to do justice, in essence, means to love. The human capacity to love is profoundly embedded in God's self-communication. Rahner asserted that no human act of love is ever immune from saving grace. Real love, as that which is necessary for justice in the world, cannot be generated by the human alone. The turn to love the neighbor in justice is given as a gift and done not by our strength, but by God's grace. 
Consequently, justice, which is rooted in love, is also always a gift. Thus, grace gives justice its full meaning and an understanding of its origins. Rooted in gratuitousness, God's gift of love is not just a tool one can use for justice. Rather, it requires the human choice and response to act. In light of the connection between justice and love, it becomes clear that a rights-only understanding of justice is void of the gratuitous nature of justice proposed here. At the origins of all written articulations of rights lies this transcendental horizon of which Rahner speaks. Furthermore, rights require duties, embodied as responses in love to one's neighbor. Today, there is a stress on the protection of one's rights, while the corresponding duties germane to these remain tremendously overlooked. The language of gift when speaking of justice is also more in accordance with the fact that justice is an act of love. When we speak of justice as a right, we speak from a place of power. It is my right or her right to have food takes a stance of authority. Justice as a gift assumes that one does not have control over one's life, and that the very act of doing justice is embedded in God's gracious love. One takes a stance of humility through which one continually strives to act in line with God's righteousness, delving deeply into the spirit experiences that guide one to recognize opportunities for justice. The Good Samaritan's response comes from his placing himself in the reality of the injured man. God's self-communication helps the Samaritan to understand that the situation required his neighborly love. By viewing justice as a gift, we will be better able to respond and act beyond what written laws dictate as the Samaritan did. In conclusion, the redefinition of justice as a gift touches the deep roots of the Christian faith and the mystery and gratuitousness of God's grace. One's ability to get in touch with how to recognize injustice and respond is fundamentally connected to one's willingness to recognize God's self-communication amidst the quotidian. At the heart of this search for a redefinition of justice is the question of why, as Christians, we are driven to help others. Rahner's foregriff and theology of grace allow us a clear answer. The human being is continually experiencing and longing for God, and God, in love, makes possible human responses for the neighbor. Justice as a gift requires the building of communities of love when we engage in service to others. If, as is the case in our world, the focus of justice is only to knock down unjust organizations and to serve justice when rights are violated, without building up what is true and what is love, then justice will remain temporary and regional. Sooner rather than later, other injustices will arise and the cycle of rights violations and retribution will continue. If, however, we understand justice as a gift and focus more on putting ourselves in the place of the suffering, paying attention to God communicating to us, we can more readily work toward the realization of the kingdom on earth. This requires true metanoia, via a willingness to remain aware of injustice and a commitment to remain connected to God through the spiritual life. On a communal level, it requires helping others to understand and incorporate this mindset of justice into their lives. When we work with and for the poor, for example, we learn about radical faith and dependence on God. These, experience, these experiences thrust us toward transcendence. However, if they are not reflected upon, and we do not realize that what is good among the poor is the same as what is good and possible in our homes, we will continually fail to do justice. By letting ourselves go into the experience of the spirit, true transformation can occur in ourselves and our families. If not, we will never become bridges between communities, and we will only continue to go to the poor for energy, for a sense of satisfaction for helping others, or for a sense of home. True metanoia begins by rethinking justice and understanding that Christian love is not about affection, but about forgiveness, reconciliation, and a law deeper than litigation, the law of grace. We are called to do justice in humility because loving our neighbor is a genuine, gratuitous, life-giving and loving gift from God. Thank you.
Magali, I'd like to thank you for a very thought-provoking article and for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts. I'd like to say, as a caveat, though, that I know the paper you've presented is an extremely condensed version of your longer work and that some of the questions I raise may well be answered in that longer thesis. And I would invite you to share what that thesis <laughs> says if that's the case. Um, I think Magali, with Rahner's help, has touched upon a theme of vital importance in the Christian life that an overemphasis upon autonomy, uh, grasping at authority or power, is to forget the fact of God's gratuitous grace working in our lives. A self-asserting possession versus openness to God's will and service to others is uh, a failure to recognize the reality of the Christian life. Apart from God's love, we can do nothing. And forgetting that leads us to neglect our relationships with God and with one another. Justice, as much as any other moral principle, must be understood and enacted in the framework of gratitude and humility towards God. As someone who is sadly underfamiliar with Rahner's work, I'm working on it, I also appreciated your explanation of his concept of the pre-apprehension of being, the foregriff. I hear in this concept an echo of a parallel principle, which you gesture toward, the moral theologian Cinderasis. Sindericis, or to pick up on Ratzinger's use of the platonic term anamnesis, refers to the innate human capability to understand right and wrong, and to desire the good and shun evil. Persons may be mistaken about that which is good, or disagree about the best way to achieve it, but that does not obscure the fact that they recognize that there is such a thing as good, and that it ought to be pursued. Both Sindericis, and more importantly in the context of this paper, the foregriff, point to a fundamental truth. There are certain inherent capacities in human nature that are placed there by God and point toward him. Just as Sindericis allows us to know the good, and therefore God, without necessarily being aware of how or why we know it, the foregriff enables us to be aware of God and God's working in our lives, even if we are not aware of our awareness. God is active in every human soul whether or not the individual knows it. This fact is relevant not only for ourselves and our own moral lives, but for the way in which we interact with other persons in whom God is also working. I do have a few questions regarding the argument you've laid out, whose answers would, I think, strengthen your argument. The first one, I was laughing to myself as you were reading, because a lot of your final edits actually took it out. Um, so, um, no, that's okay. It's a beautiful demonstration of the, the work of editing. Um, but I, I wonder whether this is still in your original thesis, and I think, I think the question still stands. Um, and in your penultimate drafts, uh, my question has to do with uh, what a gift-based understanding of justice is opposed to. There's a sense of opposition um, in your paper, both toward sort of a, a rights-based understanding of justice and also to sort of a popular or common sense perception of justice. Um, and several times in the course of those penultimate drafts, uh, you made reference to common or popular conception of justice, presuming that they are based upon civil law or explicit religious law in texts. Um, there's a framing of the issue in terms of opposition or, or even antagonism. And I don't think that the assumption that underlies that opposition is necessarily justified. Um, while civil or religious laws may play a role in one's understanding of what justice entails in any given situation, I would hesitate to ascribe the totality or even the majority of popular conceptions of justice to adherence to civil law. In fact, some of our strongest feelings of moral outrage at perceived injustice arise when our innate sense of justice, born of the foregriff, conflicts with civil or ecclesiastical statutes. Uh, witness to name one very specific recent example, the outcry over Florida's so-called stand your ground law in the recent Trayvon Martin case. It's a classic case of an inherent understanding of justice standing opposed to civil law. And there are many debates uh, within the Catholic Church uh, that contrast the census fidelium with canon law or ecclesial disciplines that I think also demonstrate this principle. So framing the case for justice as gift as standing in opposition to popular wisdom might not be helpful. Rather, I think an understanding of justice as gift builds upon the moral instincts that persons already possess. Your use of the foregriff in constructing this argument plays perfectly into this reflex that I think we can all relate to. 
I would suggest focusing on the parallels between this concept and basic human moral instincts rather than placing them in opposition to one another. These were all thoughts sparked by your penultimate drafts. I, would, I look forward to seeing the final product I do. And finally, a question that may not have any relevance for your paper, but which I'm curious about. Given your description of justice as so closely tied to love, do you see a distinction between justice and charity? Are they simply two names for the same thing, two sides of the same coin? Is justice a subset of charity? And conversely, is injustice more properly understood simply as a failure to love? If there is a distinction, it may be helpful to more clearly define it and explain what acting in justice concretely entails, as opposed to simply acting in charity. And if these two are effectively synonymous, the point could also be emphasized more, since they are so often juxtaposed in both theological and popular conceptions. Again, however, thank you for a very thoughtful and very thought-provoking piece that throws into relief the importance of love and the awareness of God's continual grace for the human person. I look forward to reading your thesis. Thank you.